Hello and welcome to this edition of Mark in the Park, the program from Urbana Park District that lets you know what's going on in your community. Urbana Park District, you belong here. I'm joined today by Timothy Bartlett, Executive Director for Urbana Park District. How are you today? Doing great. Thanks, Mark, for great. having me on. All right. And we're talking Kickapoo Rail Trail. It's one of my favorite topics. How did the rail trail get its start? Well, it's really a very interesting and long story. I always tell it in kind of two folds because there are really two parts to the whole story. A long time ago, about 30 years ago, a local foundation called Champaign County Design and Conservation Foundation, locally called CCDC, just for short, a lot of people know us by CCDC, um, had a chance to look at a rail banked corridor that at that time was owned by Conrail. Conrail was, I think, the consolidated rail company, sort of a gov government reconfiguration of a lot of small railroads. But this section that was connected from uh, Urbana, I always think of Urbana because we're in Urbana, mm -hmm. and then goes east over to the Danville area near Kickapoo State Park, uh, had been rail banked and it was on the um, Federal Register and so it was picked up by one of our local people and that's where that idea started. A man named by John Gwynn, local attorney in Urbana, kind of a CCDC member took that on as a project and said, gee, we should really get behind this. This could be a really great opportunity to get Urbana connected to a regional trail system. And so at that point, CCDC took the project on and John was what we call the trail manager or kind of chair of that subcommittee that uh, CCDC oversaw. And what John did is began a dialogue with Conrail in trying to find ways to convince Conrail that it would be a good idea to either sell or ideally donate that whole corridor uh, to somebody locally. CCDC was the group that said we could take it. And then I think the plan was they would transfer it to local, probably, agencies if they could do that. So John worked very hard with CCDC, and the, my understanding, it was before I joined the foundation, but he worked about six or seven years and got to a point where Conrail agreed to actually donate the whole corridor. And so he had spent, you know, probably eight, eight years already invested in the pre-analysis and then working directly with the rail company. Um, and that was great news. It was a kind of an announcement, hey, we got the trail donated. Mm -hmm. Unbelievably, but and unknown to CCDC, internally, Conrail had actually sold their interest to CSX, another rail provider oh, in the area. So that was a big blow to CCDC. So started checking, okay, what's CSX going to do here? Are they going to just recognize that donation and just sort of transfer it over? Well, guess what? They didn't recognize that donation, and their stance was, we're not sure what happened with Conrail. It's a separate, different organization and company, um, but CSX uh, has access to this, and you know they see it as part of their viable you know, rail business. So that started really the second story of this process. CCDC essentially had to start all over again with a brand new rail company. Oh, boy. And it's very different. Anybody that's done rail work or knows about it knows it's very slow. It's... Um, painstaking work and I think the idea is you have to understand it took me a long time to understand this but you know these rail companies are international global corporations they have interest all over the world in in transportation so to get their attention on a little segment tiny as important as it is to Urbana to get them to shift their business focus solely to get this you know taken mm -hmm. care of um, isn't really in their business interest and the other thing I learned and they by working with CSX is I got the understanding that many of these rail I trail ideas don't come to fruition. You know, they'll start. And so the company has to take a very careful analysis. How much time and effort can we really put to these things? And then maybe lastly, they like having rails. And mm -hmm. so it's not something that they intuitively just, hey, let's get this done. It's a good thing for everybody. So under that premise, you basically have to kind of slog through that long process of uh, trying to gain some footing and justify why you should have access and then go through that whole process. So in working with CCDC, I came on in a, the, um, and by the way, this is not a linear time story because mm -hmm. it kind of goes in chunks. Mm -hmm. I came on to CCD, C, CCDC later and was asked to take on uh, the chair uh, responsibilities for the rail trail. But I want to back up just a little bit uh, before that. One of the first organizing meetings that happened, happened in Urbana at the Lake House. And the idea was to have kind of a quiet meeting to get all the potential stakeholders, and that would include Park District, the City of Urbana, Champaign County Forest Preserve, 
um, Kickapoo uh, State Park folks, people over at uh, Vermilion County Conservation District that would likely be involved, CCDC representatives, certainly our attorneys uh, that you know volunteer their time. IDNR was here too, and IDOT. But the idea of the discussion was, is this really a viable option? And I think at the end of that meeting, it was determined, yes, this should really be a project we, we should pursue. And the other part about rail projects, it takes everybody's help and effort. It's very difficult for one agency or one group to get the job done. It takes a lot of inner cooperation. So from that point, there was an interest, there was support by CCDC. They found out later that Conrail didn't own it any longer and that process started. So I started working my early years in the sort of mid 90s, um, working with the two cha the, uh, trail chairs that were working uh, at that time in getting some background information. I actually was one of the first few people that walked the trail. Another one of our mm -hmm. employees at the park district walked about five miles out, mm -hmm. five miles back. And that's when it was completely overgrown. You could barely see the rail bed. We just wanted to experience, is there actually a rail corridor there? What would it be like? Can you access it? Our conclusion was, yeah, if this was acquired and cleaned up and opened up, this would make a fantastic uh, trail. Something that motivated me too, personally, you know, why did I care to do this? What would motivate me to be involved with this? And one thing I noticed when I look around the urban areas, we don't have a regional trail system. Many other Big Ten mm -hmm. university towns have interconnected city trails. They have often regional trails that go outside of their boundaries. And it really serves their, their residents. A lot of our university folks obviously don't have cars. And so relying on walking, biking is really critical to get around, not only to do your business, to go to school, but also to spend free time out in the area to go visit parks and you know recreate and exercise, things like that. So that was a real motivator because the what if we could get this done was a real driver to me. Wouldn't that be a great thing for Urbana? So I early on signed on because I really could see the benefit for the Urbana Park District and the mm -hmm. city of Urbana. If we could bring this regional trail that would link into our local bike trails here in Urbana, we'd have a really neat system. So that was my motivation to keep working mm -hmm. at that. So for the next essentially you know, 15 years, I spent kind of working through that system. And it's mostly filled with disappointment and frustrations. <laughs> Um, any person you had a lead that could be a contact that maybe had a connection with the rail company or was adjacent landowner or had some experience, you have to, like almost like a mystery case, you have to work down every single lead, will it lead to another solid connection? The good news is we had so much help and so much support by so many different people that it's really a shared story. So many people have their piece of it or what they brought to the table. So. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure everyone that's listening would know that it's it's should be celebrated by so many different groups and organizations that we got this done. And hearing how many hoops you had to jump through, mm -hmm. I'm sure it was a very emotional, happy day when that thing opened. It, it really is. I'll never forget the stunning day. It was Steve Rugg and I and the, uh, the Jerry Padgett, the at that time the executive director of the Forest Preserve, sitting in my office talking with the real estate agent who made the decision ultimately that had the authority through their corporation to actually agree we will sell it. Um, now just a few things I wanted to add. Obviously, how did you come to the valuation? That's always one of the big issues. Mm -hmm. What are you going to pay? And so the short answer is we really evaluated when we started looking at the corridor, we noticed that there were parcels in this rail bank corridor that's a sort of a protective covenant that they often mm -hmm. and hopefully place on many of these corridors. The neat thing about rail banking is it preserves the right under circumstances to reactivate a rail corridor, which is a good thing because mm -hmm. there could be a time of war or a deep economic uh, impact or an opportunity. Rarely are they reconverted, but there is that provision. That's what makes them so desirable. They mm -hmm. really do protect that assembled corridor, which are very hard to do. Think about it. If you had to go buy every single property in a 25-mile corridor yeah. and deal with every landowner, it would be very onerous. So what we ultimately looked at is what parcels does the rail company actually own and which ones did they acquire through quick deed or transfers of sales that they actually didn't pay a price on. And mm -hmm. once we got to, I call it getting the yes on that, mm -hmm. where they actually admitted, okay, we don't own all those properties. We actually own less than half of those properties. That was the way we basically could figure this out. We said, what if we paid a price, a reasonable price for the owned properties and you recognize the other properties in a donation format. What really ultimately motivated that decision was we kept putting that letter that 
Conrail had given us, mm -hmm. that they were actually donating the mm -hmm. property to us. And it, I think it made it very difficult for them to want to ignore that. Another company saw at least some value in this yeah. and that there would be some willingness. In the end, they recognized that and used that as a basis for at least their donation portion. And then we were able to put a reasonable uh, number on the unowned properties that really hadn't been acquired by mm -hmm. the rail company. And that got us to yes. Um, we also then worked with some uh, local uh, conservation groups that do short-term loans to be able to acquire the property you know, as quick as we could and then create a payback system. Ultimately, the plan was the two responsible agencies that would most likely want and be able to manage the corridors is our forest preserves and conservation districts in our two counties. So it was, you know, prearranged, would you accept this if these were acquired? And they said yes, if, you know, they were acquired in a way that uh, didn't put undue cost or burden to us, we, we would accept that. And so that was sort of the conduit to purchase them and do then a quick transfer to the two responsible landowners. So in Champaign County, the Forest Preserve Correct. District, quote unquote, runs the... That's right. They would actually be the rail trail. owner, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, again, they are rail mm -hmm. banked, so mm -hmm. it is a special classification. But they have all the judiciary and management responsibilities. And then mm -hmm. the, uh, the parallel partner in Vermilion County is the Vermilion County Conservation District. Now, in Easter Banner, right around Walmart is when, where you can get on it. But you yes. can actually uh, come to Urbana Park District at Weaver Park. Correct. And park and unload your bikes there. Absolutely. And yeah. One of the things that we learned in, in uh, laying trails out is you can never have too many uh, contact points, mm -hmm. what we call trailheads, basically jumping on points. Now, we like to think that every doorstep in Urbana is a trailhead, uh -huh. which is a nice way to think, but you still need some physical locations where people know about that they can actually show up. So it's very common on many of our uh, other trails throughout the state uh, to have multiple connection points. So you're correct. Today, you can go to Walmart, take your bicycle there with you on your car or in your van or truck, and you can actually park your vehicle in that uh, edge area that, that Walmart's designated as a parking area, and you can physically directly access the uh, rail co uh, corridor there. Or we've made a second trail connection at Weaver Park on the north end of the park, right off Main, East Main Street in Urbana. And the idea is that not only can you make a, a close by connection to get to the trail, but we can also start hosting of activities and events. So having a park site or at least an area where you could host events or a race or you know music or entertainment or a biking mm -hmm. event, um, that's where the park really comes into play and, and helps that. And one thing that uh, was ex has been exciting news is a potential to even extend the KRT, the Kickapoo Rail Trail, into Urbana. Now it's a lot. It took 30 years to get the exactly. <laughs> to get the rail trail launched. Right. This isn't going to be an overnight thing, and it may not even happen. That's correct. But we're going to talk about it and study it. Absolutely. We feel very, very fortunate uh, to get this opportunity. I should back up again and suggest, I think after we secured the original 24.5 mile corridor, we already knew we should start looking at how do we bring this further into Urbana. Mm -hmm. I think if you walk onto the trail today and you look toward downtown Urbana, it's not very difficult to imagine that would be a very great connection. Um, and proximity and access is really key to trail corridors. Is it easy for your residents to find and to get onto? Many of our communities we've went to look at as uh, sort of trial sites have really capitalized on what we call their downtown urban corridors. What we notice is businesses opening, businesses opening front doors to the corridor, people creating open space, public art, activities and events. So it really adds to the liveliness of, of a downtown area. So we began looking several years ago at could is that a reasonable, feasible idea? And I think the local agencies partnering on this project said yes. This is something we would want to do. So last summer we had the opportunity, working with one of our interns at the Park District, to put some ideas together. What could that look like? And we were able to share that with uh, Urbana's mayor and some of the leaders and our partners in town to really kind of evaluate that and, and see that that would be a desirable um, activity. Other good fortune, we found that there was a um, Department of Transportation grant that would allow us to do this study. It's pretty rare these days to, to get grants and even more rare to get what I'd call research or planning grants to assist that because it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of time, which adds to a lot of cost. 
to really go through the painstaking work that it takes to sort of unravel. It's like a mystery. Mm -hmm. Who owns what parcel? What's the history? How are those sites used? Are there any um, negative impacts on that site? Was there any spills or rail issues? Uh, are there any unsafe conditions that exist today? So this opportunity to study the connection that comes into downtown will actually hopefully answer a lot of those questions. And we may find we get the green light and that it's a viable corridor to continue to pursue, or we might find out there's a number of what I call barriers or blockage that may prevent that from happening. It doesn't mean they could never be overcome, but it just adds to that complexity of, of getting a clear corridor. Now, just so people know, it would be uh, to extend the corridor, it would be down the uh, railroad, down, um, uh, down kind of near where Lincoln Avenue runs. Right. Our boundaries today would really go from the end of where the corridor ends, which is near Weaver Park. In fact, mm -hmm. it's kind of funny because it sort of just stops, mm -hmm. um, and it almost looks like a random stop. But as mm -hmm. we understand, rail companies own various sections. They'll often own short sections on a rail because that gives them control on what actually happens through there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we hope to learn the full history and uh, maybe understand all the, the details about that. But essentially from where it ends today to Lincoln Avenue, that's sort of our boundary. We selected that one, it would be a great next phase. It would mm -hmm. get us through the whole downtown area and also connect nearby to some of our Urbana parks. Mm -hmm. um, the other is there's so much information and complexity with these, mm -hmm. you literally probably need to break them down into phases and study that. But our hope is we could go beyond Lincoln, hit campus and be able to eventually push through into west side of Champaign and their downtown. That would be such a fantastic thing if it comes through. Mm -hmm. uh, but even if it is feasible, then you have to work with the railroad company exactly. because they still run a train there every exactly. once in a while. We should note any of our listeners that it is an active. That section that brings it through downtown is an, it's still an active line. While there's minimal train activity, there is some. So that's one of the things we'd like to do is who's getting service from those corridors? What is their business plan for transportation today and in the future? Is that corridor completely viable? Um, which would suggest we know there's other communities that have side-by-side, -side, meaning you have an active rail, and there's usually often some sort of protection or fence or barrier, but then there'll be the, the <clears throat> trail or the, the, you know, the walking, hiking, biking opportunity right next to it. So it isn't necessarily should be assumed that, oh, if there's an active corridor, you can't have a, a, a rail or a bike trail next to it. Okay, so that's not an automatic It's not an scholar. automatic. Obviously, from a user, from a bicyclist or a pedestrian, it's probably more desirable to not mm -hmm. have train activity. <laughs> but if you really understand there's literally about two trains a week, you know, mm -hmm. the frequency is so low, it, it's, it seems reasonable that that wouldn't, couldn't work out. Yeah. And as you do the <clears throat> feasibility study, it could be, you could get a green light but still it's not a guarantee because Correct. then you have to figure out how you're going to pay for this Absolutely. thing. They're very, very expensive um, you know, ventures. So breaking them into phases, looking at how, you know, basically what's the acquisition process. So we'll, first we'll study it. If we get that green light, then we'd move probably into an acquisition phase. That's when we start to do the evaluations on cost. What would the terms be? You know, how do we convince the rail company to, to sell that? Or perhaps it ends up in a lease. Maybe it's not owned. Maybe there's a lease or we're given a right-of-way where we could actually, you know, build this, this uh, trail alongside of it. So there's a number of opportunities. Probably each rail company has their preferred approach or they handle it based on the circumstances. So I guess what I'm saying, there's no uniform standard applied here. Mm -hmm. You literally work through every single, grind it through with every issue, and each company has different standards. And we'll know the feasibility, whether or not it's feasible in 2020. I, I think that's a fair statement. We should have enough information to say, does this look more feasible, or are there so many obstacles against it that it just can't happen at this, this time? And it may be something that has to be looked at down the road, but our hope, our expectation, is we keep working in a dil diligent way and that we, we get that green light. And hopefully uh, the Kickapoo Rail Trail could extend into downtown Urbana, but whether it does or doesn't, the Kickapoo Rail Trail so well fits into the mission of Urbana Park it District. It absolutely does, and I would add, Mark, something the viewers might not know is the Park District right now in the Forest Preserve District, we're working in Vermilion County, working with their staff, with the City of Danville staff, with the Conservation District staff, in trying to get their section actually constructed. That's the next phase is take it from Champaign County into Vermilion County. And it's so important to Urbana because we know once that whole corridor, and we're bookended essentially from Urbana to Danville, 
now we have a regional trail that's going to benefit every community along that corridor. So it's in our best interest to make sure that their end is successful too. It would be fair to say it wouldn't be a successful corridor if it ended abruptly and we couldn't get the other portion built or it took so long to get it built that you know we, we lose that momentum of, of interest in it. And so we're working very hard to get them in a position. One of the benefits is we've learned a few things and so we can help maybe streamline their efforts so that you know, it, it literally a lot of it is trial and error. If we can tell them, do it this way or try this because we've had success, obviously, you know, that'll speed that up. And they're very eager to accept our help, working in a wonderful fashion. And we're going beyond even the physical development, but we're starting to move into management practices. How do we begin setting it up so groups can come in and hold an event? How do we manage that? And so I think ultimately, like some of the more successful Illinois corridors, they generally move into some sort of shared partnership. Often a formal approach, like a commission, is organized where there's representation ultimately by every community along the rail corridor. That's something we see as a desirable outcome because what it does, it gives everybody a piece and a part and a voice in how to, how to treat that amenity. It's a great rail trail. We hope people use it. and. Maybe it might get even a little bit bigger as the years go on. We'll be watching. Absolutely, and we're going to stay busy doing that. Timothy Bartlett, thank you. Thank you, Mark, for having me on. All right. Timothy Bartlett, Executive Director of Urbana Park District, our guest today on Mark in the Park, talking Kickapoo Rail Trail. For more information about the Kickapoo Rail Trail, you can go to Urbana Park District at look up Weaver Park. Uh, we're online at uh, urbanaparks.org. For more information, you can also check us out on uh, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter as well. Remember, you belong on the Kickapoo Rail Trail and you belong at Urbana Park District. I'm Mark Schultz. Thanks for joining us.